We are going to talk to Jeff Jarvis. As we're trying to set up the connection, I will give you brief information about Jeff. He's a TV and media columnist and critic. Uh, I wish you could have made it, but Sandy sort of, yeah, the, you couldn't make it. But it's still inspiring to see you and to hear you. The audience is so excited. We're ready with our hashtag Big Tent Turkey, and we're ready to hear you. But before we start, can I give a brief explanation and notes about who you are? Okay, I'm um, Jeff Jarvis. Let me introduce you, uh, Associate Professor and Director of the Tau Knight Center for Entrepreneur Journalism, Girişimci Gazetecilik, Türkiye'de en çok özlemini çektiğimiz kavramlardan biri at the City University of New York's Graduate School of Journalism. He is also a consulting editor, a partner at Daily, a Day Life, and Jeff is the editor of boozmachine.com. Uh, hepimiz için uh, heyecan verici bir blog, boozmachine.com'u çoğunuzun takip ettiğini tahmin ediyorum. Most of the audience is probably following you on your blog, boozmachine, Jeff. So we'll have like a 10 minutes of introduction while Jeff will be introducing his opinions on journalism, on entrepreneurship, on internet, and the democratization of information and journalism for sure, I hope. Uh, we'll have like 10, 12 minutes, and we could take one or two questions from the audience, or, or if you don't have any questions, I'll be asking one or two, and we hopefully will finish it like 15 or 20 minutes. Jeff, would you? Thank you so much, and I'm, I'm so sorry I uh, was not able to be there, thanks to Sandy. It makes us realize how fragile our technology uh, it really is when we lose connectivity, but this is amazing, thanks to Hangout, that I can be there, so I appreciate that. So in 10 minutes, I want to talk about five big ideas. Um, and we'll see how we can do with them. The first is to argue that it is too soon to understand what the internet is. It is too soon to define it, and thus it is too soon to regulate it. When uh, Gutenberg invented his press, uh, Elizabeth Eisenstein, who's a key scholar of Gutenberg, says that it took 50 years before the shape of the book to really be known, 100 years for the impact on society to be known. And so in that sense, we're only in the year 1472 in Gutenberg years on the net. And I think it is way, way too soon to try to have industry and government band together to try to regulate the net and to try to protect the legacy institutions of society from its disruption. It is far better to understand the disruption of the net, understand that yes, it can be used for good things or bad things, but then find the opportunities in it and try to go from there. So that's a context where I think it's very important that that's why I wrote my book, Public Parts, is to argue that we have this magnificent tool that enables any of us to be public, speak to a public, organize or act as a public. And I think that's very powerful. And I do not want to see that hemmed in too soon. That leads to the second point, which is that I think we're going to see that we are simply going to have more and more speech. And I recognize that sometimes that can be frightening and that can be difficult, as in the case of the horrible, stupid video that caused problems out of the US recently. But, uh, and we in the US believe in the First Amendment, believe that speech is important above all. There's a wonderful Turkish academic named uh, Zeynep Tufekci, who uh, has been spending the year at Princeton here in the US, who's just really quite brilliant. And in the midst of that discussion about the video, she taught me a lot. And one, she said, is that we in the US, of course, have to understand that our culture is different and that in other cultures where speech is often regulated, if bad speech comes out unregulated, it's presumed to have been approved, which was not the case in the US. We all thought the video was awful. Um, and, and so there's cultural differences clearly that come along. But the internet itself, I would argue, is architected like our First Amendment in the US. It is architected to allow anyone to speak to anyone, and it is architected to get around any blockades and regulation. That is the nature of the net. It's a nature that I celebrate because I celebrate speech, and we're gonna have more and more of it. And of course, there's the bad side of all this new speech and things like that stupid video, but there's the magnificent side of this new speech and things like the Arab Spring, where, important to say this was not a Twitter revolution, it was not a Facebook revolution, it was a revolution of brave people but they used these tools of Twitter and Google and Facebook and YouTube to communicate with each other, creating a flow of information that occurred without media, without mediators. Now, we as journalists then have to look at this and say, what do we do? We used to tell the entire story. All the information came from us. 
But in this new world, you do what you do best and link to the rest. You see what's going on, and if we can have the, the platforms that enable a flow of technology without us, that's wonderful. We as journalists then need to figure out how to add value to that. And I recommend looking at the story of a, a, a tweeter named uh, Andy Carvin, who has a book coming out from our, my university in December called Distant Witness. That we'll talk about how he added value to that flow of information by figuring out who was there and reliable I in these countries, that's nodes and networks of people, by verifying things, debunking false reports, uh, adding context, getting people to help. That's the new relationship that we should have in media and journalism with the public. And that leads to my third point. I think that we in media have to understand that we may not be in the content business anymore. We may instead be in the relationship business. I went to a conference here in New York yesterday where I heard big old media people talking about how they have to protect the value of their product. And they do, because that's their old business model. But I pointed out to them that Google and Facebook have a different view of this. Yes, they see content as valuable, but they extract that value in a very different way. And that is in building relationships with people, learning about people, using them as, I would say, signal generators. My Android phone, which I like very much, by the way, <laughs> and my, I'll go full board, and my Nexus 7 uh, are, are signal, I'm buying the new ones too, I'm, I'm pathetic. Um, you seem so connected, Jeff. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I actually have switched, my, I this is not an, I used to use an iPhone, I've now switched. So, so this is a signal generator for Google, obviously, right? It tells, it tells Google where you are, what you want, who you know, uh, what you're looking for and so on, so that Google or Facebook or Twitter or other companies that work this way can try to serve you better, serve you relevance. That's the way that these new companies operate, while the old media companies still operate thinking that they produce a product, right? They produce, pardon me for the other plug, a, something you can touch and sell. And I'll happily sell you this, it's my product. But, um, but that model of copyright, of protecting ownership, I think is an old model that, that we have to rethink. And we in media have to rebuild ourselves around creating relationships with people, learning about them, serving them better as a result, and we're not built that way. So I'll go to the fourth, which then this leads to issues of privacy, of course. And, and let me emphasize that, that privacy matters. I respect privacy. It needs protection. It's very important. But again, I also see this magnificent benefit we have with the net to be public, that suddenly anyone can talk to the world now. Anyone can find anyone else. Anyone can organize with other people, can act with other people. That's a magnificent thing we saw live out in the Arab Spring, which is so, so important. And so my fear is that if we get too concerned about trying to just protect against bad things that could happen, we may also limit the good things that can happen. And I want to be concerned here about the idea of trying to regulate technology. It's a mistake. Because if you think that you can regulate technology to stop all the bad things, you're also going to prevent the good opportunities that can come with that. And, and I would argue that we need to have some considerable caution about that. Um, so privacy matters, yes. Uh, it's important, I think, to not regulate the collection of data, but instead to regulate how it's used and to uh, my industry, media and technology and advertising have been awful at telling people what we're doing and why we're doing it, what it does for them, and to give them control over it. We have to get better at that. But we also have to say to regulators in countries around the world, especially I would argue in the EU, that if you try to step in now and argue that the, everything the internet does is dangerous, that tracking is bad, then you could also cut off the value of media and the value of advertising and thus, you could cut off a lot of journalism and content that's going to come and only have less content and more paywalls. And I fear that. So privacy matters. It needs protection. I think it's very well protected. But I also want to protect publicness. I want to protect this magnificent tool we have to be able to do what we want to with it. And so uh, I, I argue that we have to talk about principles of the public society and openness and transparency. And we've got to recognize that we have a right to connect we have a right to speak. We have a right to assemble and act. We have to recognize that all bits, pardon me, my lady here in my office thinks that I've died, so I have to stand up and... Oh, oh. <laughs> well, it doesn't work, so I'll go, okay. go without lights. 
Every five minutes, it checks to make sure I'm still here and it thinks I've died, <laughs> um, if you can see me. Uh, so so we have, every bit is created equal, and if any bit is stopped along the way to someone else, then no bit can be presumed to be free. So that's the essence of net neutrality. All bits are created equal. And if one bit cannot get from one end of the internet to the other because a company or a government detoured it or stopped it, either to censor or to uh, create favorable business clients, uh, climates, then, um, then no bits can be presumed to be free. And the internet is not free. The internet must be distributed and open. No one, no government, can claim sovereignty over the internet or stop the internet anymore. Last point, fifth. Okay. I teach entrepreneurship here. Yeah. And I think it's very important to, to understand that um, we're moving, I believe, from an economy of vertical industries in the US where Let's say in media, you own everything. You create the content, you market the content, you distribute the content, you do all these things. We're moving instead to an economy of ecosystems where you have layers of many, many players that now replace those big single industries. You have a platform layer like Google that enables people to succeed on top of it, to start companies, to start enterprises, to start movements. So there's a platform layer. There's an entrepreneurial layer with lots of little things that can stop, start above that because the platforms exist. So my students here can now start media businesses. I started a magazine called Entertainment Weekly that went through $200 million. No one's going to do that anymore. But my students can start media businesses now with a few thousand dollars. And then there's a third layer, which is networks, bringing together these disparate uh, ventures so that they can reach critical mass. So, it's a different way to look at business, a different way to look at investment, a different way to look at the economy and how it operates in thinking of ecosystems and entrepreneurs and platforms and networks instead of vertical industries. So when we look at government regulation, we have to be cautious that we're not protecting necessarily just the old economy of industries, but we also nurture this new economy of innovation and investment. I'm a New Yorker, I talk very fast and I apologize for that. Uh, but it did get us through in 10 minutes, and I'm eager to have a discussion, not just questions, but also argument. Exactly, Jeff Jervis, that was lovely. That was very strong. Thank you so much. Yeah. So you can't see that, but you can hear the claps of the audience, I hope. Yeah, lovely. We love New Yorkers. No problem. That was very brief, very strong, very to the point. So we're ready for the questions, I guess. Any questions from the room? Uh, my friends will help you with the mics, and we, need, we, we have very limited time. So if you have any questions, don't miss this moment. This is or the moment. Or arguments, challenges. Or arguments, challenges. Yeah, Jeff is ready for any of them. So any questions? Türkçe'de alabilirim soruları. Yes, we have one over there. Uh, I was listening to you and I was thinking about it. Are there any good things uh, that the technology and internet is destroying, right? So, uh, I mean, you, you talk a lot about uh, many different dimensions of uh, internet, social media and everything, but what are those good things that the technology is destroying? That was good. Yeah, Jeff, you, you heard it, right? Yes, I did. Okay. Okay. Um, that's an argument we, we often have when it came to, let's say, newspapers. People love newspapers, they touch newspapers, they smell newspapers. Newspapers were a magnificent business model of a near monopoly. Uh, newspapers have pricing control. And yes, the internet is killing the print model. It may well kill the book, and we love books. It may well kill other things. But look back, Gutenberg killed the business of the scribes. Uh, automobiles killed horses. Well, not horse, they didn't kill them, but it, it killed them as an industry. And, and I, don't, I prefer to look at it differently. I don't think that, if, if you think that a newspaper is something that is on paper, or a book is something on paper, then yes, it kills that. But if you think that a newspaper is information for society, or that a book is ideas, then the internet, of course, gives incredible new opportunity to expand beyond that and to do it in new ways. And I tell my students, wherever they see a problem, look for the opportunity in it. Now, that's rather glib, I'll admit. There is one thing that it kills. It kills jobs. And I, I think that's a, something we haven't come to grapple with yet, that the internet the technology brings efficiency instead of growth. We have an economy built on growth. We depend upon growth. But if you look in the US, uh, Yuri Milner, uh, the investor in Facebook from Russia, uh, argued recently in the next 20 years, we'll see 40 million retail uh, jobs in the US go away because Amazon and Google wishes to be part of this 
uh, will be part of a much more efficient supply chain of retail. Now that's gonna be good for consumers, we'll have more choice, more transparency, lower prices, but there's gonna be a tremendous displacement in society of people whose jobs aren't needed, not just because a robot comes in, but because new efficiencies of data come in. And what we have to do as a society, of course, is then educate people in new things and uh, invest in new opportunities for them. But it's going to be a very hard transition. Thank you, Jarvis, Jeff. Okay, any, any more questions from the room? This is the moment. So yeah, we have another question there. My friend with the mic is moving there. Lovely. Merhaba, Cengiz Değirmenci ben. That would be in Turkish and I would be translating that to you, Jeff. Okay, buyurun. Okay. Thank you. Ee, aslında az önceki konuşmacılara da sorabilirdim ama Jeff'e de sorayım aynısını. Ee, şimdi bir tane soru geldi. Acaba hani kontentin sahipleri, e, yani içeriğin sahipleri e, kendi ürettikleri içerik üzerinden finansal anlamda da bir kar elde edebilirler mi? Hani bu konuda ne düşünüldüğünü sordular. Oradaki gelen cevaplardan bir tanesi de bu denendi ama başarısız oldu çünkü çöp içerik ha pardon duyulmuyor mu? Özür dilerim. Şimdi orada verilen cevaplardan bir tanesinde de yani bu para elde edildiğinde insanlar çöp içerik üretmeye başladılar dendi. Şimdi kontentin aslında ürettiğinizde e, buradaki misafirlerden bir tanesinin verdiği cevap da aslında insanlar Facebook, Twitter'da ürettikleri içerikten e, finansal bir fayda elde edemeseler de başka türlü aslında bir sosyal anlamda bir manevi bir değer elde ediyorlar dedi. Bu değer de aslında bu içeriği bir şekilde kalitesiz hale getirmiyor mu? Yani insanlar sırf top trending topikte bir şeyler gözüksün diye e, bu içeriği kalitesiz hale getirmiyorlar mı? Birinci sorun bu. O zaman bu yeter. Teşekkürler. Efendim? İkinciyi de hızlı alayım. Yeterli. Teşekkürler. Peki. Biraz uzun çünkü <gülüyor> kısa tutamayacağım. Kusura bakmayın peki, o yüzden. Tamam. Peki. Peki. Uh, Jeff, the question was actually who owns the content and in what uh, procedures owns the content. Uh, Cengiz was asking about um, the businesses that have generated uh, around uh, uh, around producing content. He was saying that uh, content in any kind, I mean, um, uh, without any quality, even that started to gain money uh, uh, on the market. Uh, how are we going to differentiate between the um, qualified content and content that we can even call rubbish, you know, just to post a photo, just to write something for fun, or to add to the trend topics? That was the question. That's a very, very big question. <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think we have to look at a few things here. One is, again, as I said earlier, we, we have to look at new business models that enable content to gain value in more ways. Let me mention an example. There's, uh, I, I've long wondered why we make people all come to our content online. Why doesn't the content go to people? And then I discovered a company that has something called repost.us, R-E-P-O-S-T dot U-S. Okay. And it turns any article into an embeddable uh, piece, like a YouTube video. So content can travel around the net with brand, advertising, uh, revenue, uh, analytics, and links attached to it. Now, that then changes your motivation about how you operate your business. Now you say, damn it, don't quote me, you must come to me. And there's fights going on in especially Europe, also Brazil with Google and Google News, with publishers saying, you can't quote me. And I think they're being foolish because Google is sending them audience and people. Well, now what if you suddenly changed around and you could attach revenue to your content and let it travel? Now you're going to say, please quote me, please embed me. And, and that's very, very important as a new model and a new way to look at things. But we also have to recognize, I think, that, that this idea that we had that we make the special content and if we don't make it, it's junk, is limiting. I, I had lunch with the former head of a news operation, a, a TV news operation in the US, and he said, Jarvis, he said, um, Google and Facebook use our steel to make their cars. That's to say that they turn content into a commodity and they get all the value. It's not fair. And he said, Mark Zuckerberg doesn't respect content. And I thought about that, and I said, no, you're wrong. The problem here is that Mark Zuckerberg respects far more content than you do. We in the content business think that uh, the, I'm sorry, I just, Chrome was just reminding me of something. Uh, <laughs> Google, gets in your way. Uh, 
<laughs> we in the content business think that content is that which we as content people create and everything else is junk. Well, Facebook and Google found value in all that junk. They found that people reveal a lot about themselves. There's a, there's a, there's a hedge fund in the United States that started out of the ability to predict the mood of the country and thus the Dow Jones Industrial Average day by day because of what people say in Twitter. Silly little Twitter where we just talk about our breakfast, right? Well, not only can it be used to help organize revolutions, it can also be used to make incredible business decisions because you have to recognize and respect that there's content there. Big data about our health. I wrote about my prostate cancer as one person, yeah. and, and I did that very publicly. If a million men write about their prostate cancer, the data that creates is something really valuable. Now, who owns all that data and all that content? Do we own it as individuals? Do we own it together? Well, the answer, of course, is both. So I think we have to, yes, we're going to still have great novels, and we're still going to have great movies, and we're still going to have great journalists who explain things in new ways. We're still going to value that. But we have to open up and see new models and definitions and business opportunities for content that goes beyond just articles and books and shows. Jeff, thank you so much. It was not only inspiring to talk to you, but it was also lovely to chat to you on Google Hangout. Thanks for that. And wish you good luck with your new uh, president, Obama. <laughs> now we have a new one. Uh, I'm we, happy. You're happy, I know. <laughs> we too. And uh, he used Twitter uh, very often uh, and very excessively. We also followed him on the Twitter. So any more questions from the room could be answered from Jeff Jarvis on the internet via email or you can follow him always on the Twitter or Facebook. Thank you so much. Or, or Google Plus, Jeff Jarvis. Or Google Plus. He's also there. He's everywhere with two phones, you know, connected <laughs> anytime. He's a New Yorker. Thank you so much, Jeff. Glad to have you. Thank you so much. In the room. We are hanging out. <laughs> All right.